welcome to People in Power, I'm Juliana Rufus. On today's programme, Carbon Crusader or Carbon Cowboy? Now hang on, stop. It's not the kingpin, it's actually cockfighting Carbon Cowboy Kingpin Tree Tyrant. Whatever grand statements emerge from this month's climate change summit in Copenhagen, any deals reached will surely involve tough negotiations over money. There may be agreement about stopping global warming, there's much less about how it should be funded. Against this background, much attention is being paid to a project known as RED, a scheme for paying billions of dollars to some of the world's poorest countries for protecting their forests. It's a crucial matter because almost a fifth of global carbon emissions are the result of deforestation. Many in the West think that rainforest nations should raise this money by selling carbon credits on the open market to governments or industries seeking to offset their own emissions. But others fear that unless the scheme is properly regulated, it could just be a charter for speculators to make massive profits at the expense of indigenous peoples. So who's right? I've been to Papua New Guinea to meet an entrepreneur whose carbon trading projects reflect this growing controversy. Papua New Guinea, home to the third largest untouched rainforest in the world. It's outwardly calm, but beneath this leafy canopy something is stirring. Australian Kirk Roberts is bringing news of a miracle way of making money. Roberts is a carbon trader. In anticipation of a new global warming treaty to be negotiated in Copenhagen, he is striking up deals with forest communities to secure rights to the carbon stored in their trees. If we chop the trees down and we go logging, you get one chop. One chop and then all the biodiversity, all the water and everything becomes polluted and disappears. Your children will have nothing. You, you keep the trees and you keep the biodiversity and you let me work hard to find a way to make you get paid for that. That's carbon trading. If world leaders agree, the Copenhagen meeting will result in a deal where developed nations pay rainforest owners not to log their trees. It's called avoided deforestation. Under the so-called red scheme, carbon stored in rainforests is to be measured and sold to developed nations to offset their pollution. There's lots of opportunities to come from carbon trading. There'll be... Uh, Income for the people, there will be money provided for infrastructure to improve your roads, to help you with schools, with hospitals. This is very important, what's happening here. I congratulate everybody here. Forest communities are promised development, but for traders buying rights to carbon could spell vast profits. News of Papua New Guinea's pioneering efforts in the carbon trade has spread, so we've come to find out how this new multi-billion dollar business might work. Over the past decades, nearly 30 million hectares of rainforest have suffered from rampant and often corrupt logging. Over half the remaining lowland rainforest is now under threat. If the introduction of red carbon trading is successful, the forest will be saved. A significant step to halting global warming. Here in the capital Port Moresby, the government wanted Papua New Guinea to be the rainforest nation that showcases red to the rest of the world. An office of climate change was set up to develop a national carbon policy. If successful, the international community has promised financial assistance. But then a scandal broke. In June this year, speculative carbon deals surfaced, allegations of corruption. Bogus red certificates worth millions of dollars were leaked to the media, despite the fact that an actual red scheme still doesn't exist. In the wake of an international outcry, the director of the Office of Climate Change was suspended and all projects were put on hold. Hello. 
I'm Juliana Vukas from Al Jazeera. Yeah. Thanks for meeting with us. The new man in charge is Wari Yamo. He and his team must clean up the mess and prove that a globally regulated red scheme could function here in order to attract financing. What kind of income do you think could um, carbon trading generate for Papua New Guinea and, and what could your country, your government do with that? Well, that's basically the question everyone is asking. Are we talking billions here or not, potentially, in terms of income from carbon trade? <laughs> According to the press, I mean, if you read what's being I mean, written... If, if, if the first world decide to give billions, then that's OK, yes. Uh, but at the moment, the treaty is being still debated. If you were to summarize the situation, what, what has been the main problem over the past few months, and what are you trying to do about it? Well, the main problem is um, carbon brokers, or so-called carbon cowboys, going to... Uh, resource owners and signing up their uh, resources for carbon trading. The carbon cowboys come in and they think you can just bypass the state, go direct to the people and uh, get their consent and there you are in business. The government suspended all prospective red deals and when other brokers left, Kirk Roberts stayed, determined to make the trade work. You've been called in the media the kingpin of carbon cowboys. Why is that? Now, hang on, stop. It's not the kingpin, it's actually cockfighting carbon cowboy kingpin tree tyrant, to be accurate. But what is it that qualifies you as a carbon trader? Um, pedigree. What do you mean by that? Well, I come from a, a long range of environmentalists and uh, people that care for the country. I'm actually a hobby anthropologist. Roberts made his money training racehorses and organising cockfights. He thinks the government's position is irrelevant and waiting a decade for international implementation of RED will take too long. He wants to enter the trade in avoided deforestation directly with forest owners under the existing so-called voluntary carbon trade. Is it a stakeholders meeting this morning? Roberts is attending a meeting where interested parties are invited to respond to the government's carbon trade position. This is the chairman of SEPI. Yep. It's really my room. Roberts says he's already got carbon projects covering millions of hectares of rainforest and introduces us to his new business partners, the landowners. So how many of the landowners here, would you say, are you doing business with? Oh, I don't know. We've got quite a few. Most. Most of the landowners are doing Most business. of the landowners in that room you're do. doing business with. That's right. Roberts is joined by one of his most powerful local business associates, James Cond, the deputy leader of the ruling government party. Cond, too, thinks the official decision to wait for a global red treaty is wrong. Now, why would government deny us? If there's no carbon hydrogen, we're probably going to be able to initiate another carbon hydrogen here. Yeah. If there is voluntary carbon trading, that existed, we must take on board now. We don't want to wait another 17 years or 15 years down the line. Yes. Government must not deny us. Thank you. Thank you. But local NGOs are critical of carbon traders and their local contacts. One problem they're facing now in a lot of landowners now shouting and singing and dancing is because of the fact that these carbon cowboys are raising their expectations unnecessarily. The true landowners are always in the breach. These are town boys. They are not representing the views of the people. At the heart of the debate lies the fact that Papua New Guinea's vast rainforest reserves are owned by forest communities, not the government. Anyone wanting to do business needs to go through them. So we travel up country to meet the people everyone is talking about. Here in Lower Ramu, there is still pristine rainforest to be found and forest communities' lives have remained the same for centuries, totally dependent on the forest for food, medicines and materials. Deforestation is relentlessly encroaching. 
One of the local headmen has struck up a deal with a logging company, but the promised development has not been forthcoming. I brought it here because the needs, uh, needs of my people. The people, there is no services. We are still uh, struggling for the services. That's why I brought them there. He says he feels tricked, unable to get out of the contract. When we meet the local community, they've heard of carbon projects as an alternative to logging, but there's been little more than rumors. Do you know what carbon is? Me to me, Sabi. I don't know what is carbon. Carbon is just uh, wind or air or something like that. So uh, how they come and collect and all this? We didn't feel the carbon, we didn't even see the carbon. Back in Moresby, Roberts has run into problems with one of his largest projects, the 800,000 hectare Camulo Dorso forest. Hello, Matthew, where are you? Roberts is picking up the forest representatives. Okay, so you just, you and the lawyer wait there and I'm going to come over with the journalists from London. You tell Wissa that I'm bringing them there, make sure he's cleaned his teeth. This is Matthew. I'm Juliana from Algeria. Okay. Matthew. Matthew. Matthew Colombau and Visa Susupi say they are the director and chairman of a company called Tumu Timbers, formed to represent the landowners. Roberts is hosting them in Port Moresby's most expensive hotel, where he's turned the executive business lounge into his office. How much money are you expecting to come in? Well, that I wouldn't know, but only the figures that we are hearing is they are saying that it's so much. Like what? Maybe a billion. US dollars? Oh, maybe. Uh, yeah. So that we'll have technical people working on projects like infrastructure development, schools, you know, hospitals, bridges, airports. But there's another group from Camula Doso disputing the fact that Matthew and Wisa are the rightful representatives of Tumu Timbers, saying they have no right to sign over control of Camula Doso's vast resources to Roberts. He's saying that I'm the chairman, and he's not the chairman. Did 52 OLG sign him to be chairman? No. That's incorrect. Did you sign? No. As the case is going to court, Roberts has engaged lawyer Godwin Haumu to represent his team. We have, we have yet to basically confirm the kind of allocation in the summers. We need to receive the summers. OK, prepare the submissions for Saturday, Monday anyway. Definitely so. OK, but I don't want this adjourned and going to date this day and that day. I just said that. I want it quashed, knocked on the head straight away. But Roberts may well be up against the more formidable opponent than he lets on. We've been told that the other party is represented by a lawyer paid for by a company called IT&S. <laughs> ITNS was uh, formed back here about six years ago. We started Neville Harsley, the managing director, shows us his company's project area, which matches Roberts. This is the uh, boundary area of, of the uh, timber area referred to as Camilla Dossu, um, which is where two new timbers people come from. Uh, ITNS is an agroforestry company which wants to develop the area to agricultural use which will ultimately open it up to lucrative logging. Over the past six years, they have invested six million US dollars to gain access to Camula Doso. Securing the right documentation, says Harsley, is crucial. These documents here are compiled with hundreds of hours of work to legally identify the real landowners. People that come in to land areas and want to try and uh, take carbon sequestration rights, well, you know, without doing this process, you're not following the letter of the law. Harsley says the carbon traders have ulterior motives when they talk of big money. Millions are keener in payments and inducements to get landowners to sign agreements. When you offer such huge payments, of course they're going to sign a document. According to Harsley, Walama and Abilia are the true secretary and chairman, and these are the documents to prove it. If you win this court case, what is going to happen? Uh, if we win this uh, court case, we move to the agroforest 
and the infrastructure, which we see will bring better services and the maximum benefit to our people. Meanwhile, back at the Airways Hotel, Roberts had some good news and has prepared a press statement. Currently, our methodology is passing through its third technical review with a view to it being formally recognised within a month. Does that mean you've more or less established a technology with which you can measure and monitor how much carbon is kept in the forest by keeping the forest standing so that there is a standard according to which you can then trade? Absolutely. Real report, yeah. Assessing how much carbon is kept in trees is one of the crucial hurdles before it can be traded on the open market where it will be bought by the highest bidder. The Voluntary Carbon Standard, a regulator based in Washington, has just granted Kirk's methodology the second level of approval. With only one more level to go, it now becomes ever more crucial that the land rights to his projects are clear. It's the morning of the court case. With international business interests backing both plaintiff and defendant, it might as well be called logging versus carbon. Robert's landowners from Camula Doso are early. When he finally arrives, it becomes apparent that the lawyer hasn't. Robert thinks the lawyer is scared to come because the case has become controversial. Oh Godwin, where are you right now, please, mate? Well, hurry, please. What's your name again? Kirk Robert. Roberts has given up on Godwin and hired another lawyer on the spot. Daniel, his name is? Nori Bida. So how did you choose him? Will you tell me again? I chose him because I liked the way he walked. <laughs> and then I liked the way he talked. <laughs> he reminded me of a good racehorse. In what way? Or an inter interesting woman. Just his stance. After all of that, the case is adjourned. It's just a game. There'll be three or four more of these within the next month um, because there's people with different, agend different agendas within the government and um, uh, the higher part. Log logging is a, it's an easy way to make money by just releasing consent to logging companies. You know, they can make five, three or four or five million, who knows, um, just by a simple signature which is not bad money. But there may yet be more trouble brewing for Roberts. Investigations into the scandal engulfing the Office of Climate Change may be widened to include foreign investors. Ilya Gridnev, reporter for the Australian Associated Press, managed to obtain documents revealing a series of deals which are now part of the official probe. He has copies of letters and signed agreements which detail how Roberts hired James Cond, a key figure at the centre of government policy making, with access to the Prime Minister. Cond, who, as we've seen in other letters, basically has offered uh, you know, very close access to government, uh, that he'll get 10%, so he's missed the 10%. Both Cond and Roberts say that as an unpaid politician, Cond's entitled to take on such work. After their deal, he then contacts the PM. He says that he's actually been in talks with people, uh, i.e. Kirk, and, um, and that basically I'm now seeking a formal appointment for you, us to have an audience with you on Monday or Tuesday of next week to brief you on this matter. Please kindly, kindly inform me through your chief of staff if you're able to meet with us in one of these two days. Um, now, at this time, the chief of staff happens to be Dr. Theo Yasousu who uh, later in the year becomes the head of the Office of Climate Change. When he's the chief of staff for the Prime Minister of Office, he's already starting to negotiate with people like Kirk and people like Cond and setting up these deals, but that's not his job. His job is the chief of staff of the Prime Minister. Following an international outcry, Theo Yasousi is now under investigation and has been suspended from his post at the Office of Climate Change but he's still a close associate of Roberts, who's arranged a dinner. This gives us an opportunity to ask about the most controversial document that's been leaked. It's a red carbon certificate signed by Yasousi, which gives Roberts' company the right to the carbon in the disputed Camuladoso forest. 
this one. Which one is that? Yeah, it is. Right. So, so this document actually refers to the Camula Doso Rec project. Correct, correct. Um, and it's, it says that it's, it's under the Reduced Emissions from Deforestation and Degradation Initiative. Now, that is not yet in existence. No. It may come into existence with a hopefully, hopefully, yes. negotiations. How could you then sign off this document? We were, we were creating uh, uh, some samples that well, we kept. We never gave it out to anybody. Those are our internal working documents. So this is only one of those papers that were uh, taken out for myself. I don't have it anymore. Why would somebody steal it from your desk? Uh, political agendas. And Papuan politics can be confusing. It's not easy, for example, to find out exactly where the Prime Minister, Michael Somari, stands on the issue of carbon trading, with some here accusing him of hedging his bats in the face of so many competing interests. But when we return to the Office of Climate Change for a final visit, Wariyamo says dramatic steps have been taken to make the country a credible partner for the red negotiations in Copenhagen. Prime Minister has come out in his policy statement declaring that there should not be any voluntary carbon schemes in Papua New Guinea. The actions we will take is declare every voluntary carbon that has been signed up as illegal and then the next action that will follow is to prosecute, prosecute the brokers and the developers who are encouraging landowners to illegally sign their land up. If put into action, this could cancel all of Kirk's voluntary carbon deals, another step towards a formal introduction of red in the hope of global funding. We are investigating them. We are cleaning the mess up. So I can assure the international community we are establishing strong governance systems so that any uh, market based through red is set up, it's through a proper uh, governance system. These may be strong words, but if Papua New Guinea's history is anything to go by, big business has so far kept the upper hand and politicians have done little to clean up unsavory practices. Robert says Wariyamu does not represent the official position and his voluntary carbon trade model will bring quick profits, which will win everyone over in the end. Do you think the meeting in Copenhagen matters? No. It's, it's uh, actually irrelevant. So what matters? What matters, what matters is me getting this, uh, these projects finished and, in, and uh, being able to monitor them properly and have the buyers give me a reasonable price for each credit that we make. Do you think it is impossible that your critics or the people who want you investigated might have the last word? No, they won't even get the last laugh. That's it for this edition of People in Power. If you'd like to comment on this report or any other matter, we'd love to hear from you on aljazeera.net forward slash English. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>